Our Emeritus Professor Angela Fawcett, DAS Research Consultant from the UK, will now deliver her presentation. Professor Fawcett's topic today is Procedural Learning Difficulties and Comorbidity in Dyslexia. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the presentation of that amazing award. I cannot tell you how honoured and privileged I am to work with the DAS and to have that work acknowledged and to be able to create a platform for research across the region has just been such a fantastic opportunity and to work with such a vibrant and creative organisation. So thank you very much. Okay, so my talk today will be on procedural learning and comorbidity in dyslexia. Do I have the talk? Sherry. Thank you. Lovely. Okay, so you may wonder how this fits in with the promise of education that we talked about, that Gita talked about so movingly yesterday. Well, I want to bring back those promises that Gita raised for us and show how, from a theoretical basis, we can provide the ammunition to support that need for uh, working across the difficulties and differences that we find in dyslexia. So I'm going to talk to you about procedural learning. Procedural learning is where you learn a habit. You practice something over and over again until you can do it without thinking about it. And it seems that this is the area that is difficult if you're dyslexic. So if you think about something like learning to play tennis, learning to drive a car, learning to tie your shoelaces, that's procedural. And those are the sorts of things that you have difficulty with if you're dyslexic, as well as your reading. So uh, declarative learning, that's learning facts. That's fine. So dyslexic children will collect facts and they'll be able to tell you all of the dinosaurs they've ever come across, and more, but they won't be able to easily learn to read. So a mismatch between strengths in one area and weaknesses in another. And I'm going to talk to you about the comorbidity that's so often found in dyslexia and explain how this can be. So I'm going to talk, first of all, about challenges in dyslexia. Then I'm going to give you some theories on dyslexia and learning and dyslexia and the cerebellum. Talk about comorbidity, uh, dyslexia and the neural systems, the procedural learning uh, difficulties, and come up with some conclusions. David, could I have my water and my inhaler, please? Thank you. <coughs> so here are the challenges. There are lots, I'm afraid. There are learning differences. So if a dyslexic child cannot learn the way we teach, we must teach him or her the way he or she learns. But how does a dyslexic child learn? What's the difference? That's a key question. And there are so many overlaps between learning disabilities. It sometimes seems that what you get diagnosed with depends which specialist you see first. Everyone knows there are these overlaps, but why are they there? And there are differences in the brain. So underlying the behavioural differences, there will be brain differences, but what are those differences? Which are the most important, and how do they affect teaching? Because, of course, you can't separate the theory and the practice. One must inform the other. So two important strands which we can deliver together. Let's look at learning and cognition first of all. This was our work in the early 90s. Um, we came up with the idea that the correct description of dyslexia is in fact specific learning difficulties or specific learning disability. And so it seemed to us, this was my colleague Rod Nicholson and I in Sheffield, that dyslexia was some general deficit in learning. Not just reading, but learning generally. So for some reason, it's difficult to become an expert in a task if you're dyslexic. And that's not just the cognitive tasks, but also the motor tasks. So we came up with our automatisation deficit. And this was based initially on living with my son, Matthew, who is dyslexic, seeing how he did things. He had to work so much harder to do things that other people did without really thinking about. 
And so we came up with the theory that if you were dyslexic, your skills weren't automatic, and you had to consciously compensate even for simple skills. And it does explain why our dyslexic children can be variable in their performance and why they become so tired. So here was our target causal analysis. We wanted to differentiate the cause, the symptoms and the treatment. Now, this is an area, we don't get this in Singapore, fortunately, but there are clear symptoms of fever and the treatment is quinine. But it could also be flu. And you need to make sure you're giving the right treatment and the paroxysms are what differentiates it. So let's look at dyslexia. We have more than one type. We know that there is poor reading and that reading support works. But what are the causes? And what are the other symptoms, the secondary symptoms? And there may be more than one type of dyslexia. And so again, we know that the reading support will work. But it may be that the, under, the secondary symptoms will actually help us to under, underpack the uh, causes of the problem, indicators of the possible underlying causes. So let's look at how dyslexic children learn. So here we have the O-Guide. This is how you learn. You start off slowly at the bottom. Then you have this lovely bit where you learn beautifully and then it smooths off at the top. Is it at the beginning? Is it in the middle? Is it at the end? Is it when they try to blend two skills together? Have they not got the first one so they can't add the second one properly? Okay, so this is what we were trying to unpack for everyone. Whereabouts the difficulties lie in dyslexia? So this was a study that we did, um, that we published in 2000, blending together two simple primitive skills. So this was where the child simply had to see a flash and press a button as quickly as possible with their hand. Or hear a tone and press a button as quickly as possible with their foot. And it started with the speed going up the side. Here we have in black the dyslexic, in white the controls. And they were not significantly diff different when they were just simply pressing the button. But then we put the two tilts together, sometimes the hand, sometimes the foot. Oh my goodness. So what happens? Well, everyone goes to pieces, to be honest. Oh, look what happens. Everyone gets much worse. So what happens if you're a controlled child? Well, you can see their performance gets better and better. Over two and a half thousand trials, by the end of it, they're even faster than they were just doing the, the simple reaction. What do you think will happen for the dyslexics? Will it be the same? Whoa. Look at them all over the place. So it seems that it's the beginning and it's the end. So even after 200, two and a half thousand trials, simply pressing a button, they're not as fast as the controls. So a very simple task, no reading involved, just a speed task. They start off with problems in initially blending, they have more errors, they have slower final performance, and they have slower learning. So if we look where the difficulties lie, they're at the end, definitely. Oh, but they're also at the middle. Oh, and they're also at the beginning. Oh, no. So... And it seems that it's not just automaticity, that would account for the end, but all the way through that the children are learning differently. And we have the square root rule. It takes the square root longer for a child to learn if they're dyslexic than if they're in control. And so that means if it takes two hours to learn, if you're not dyslexic, it takes four hours. If it takes 10 hours for a non-dyslexic, then it's 100 hours. That's absolute dynamite. It takes a thousand hours to become an expert. And it does explain the difficulty that we have as teachers in remediating their reading, how much longer they need to actually learn. There are different stages and timescales of learning. This took weeks of learning. So the immediate stage of learning takes seconds. Practice takes from minutes to hours. Consolidation is overnight. Automaticity takes days to develop. This was a study of dyslexic students, high achieving students, and they simply had to perform a series of key presses like this. 
and we looked to see how many they could do in 30 seconds. And so here we can see the solid line is the dyslexics and the dotted line is the controls. And so they practice one day and come back the next day and you can see it just looks as if they're generally just a bit slower. They learn more slowly, they remain slower and they're slower at the start of the next day. But if we look at this differently, in terms of the accuracy as well as the speed, this is an effect size, and we compare their performance with the controls, we can see that their problems are when they start, okay, um, and that's combining the speed and accuracy, but what happens overnight is that magically everyone else learns better and their performance improves and our dyslexic group drop back. So remember, these are high achieving students, and even on a very simple task like this, they are showing a difference in learning. And that difference in learning means that we can never rely that we have taught them something and they know it, because they knew it one day, but instead of it embedding in their brain, they lose it overnight. Very important. <clears throat> so we have diagnostic paradox, still no agreed diagnostic method, Phonology, why are the phonological deficits? How can there be a general learning disorder, but they can be intelligent and bright children? And why is it that despite all the good intentions of everyone involved, people tend to disagree so much? And what is the best support method? What's, why is it they're not always effective in helping our children? So let's turn to neuroscience here. And here we have the cerebellum, which is a bit at the back of the brain. It was always been known to do with, to do with dexterity. 10 to 15% of the brain weight, 40% of the brain surface area, 50% of the brain's neurons. It's the hindbrain, known to be involved in dexterity, but it does actually connect the, with Broca's area, which is one of the main language areas, and it improves language dexterity, a combination of motor and mental skills. So we suggested that there were problems in the cerebellum. And it's not just us, of course, that suggested. The research across the uh, brain has suggested the cerebellar activation in a range of cognitive tasks, including reading. So things like explicit memory, language, verbal memory, verbal working memory, sequence learning, all involve the cerebellum. So explanations seem to converge on the cerebellum as a possible cause. So, from neuroscience, from cognition, from our data on behavioural skills, uh, from differences in the dyslexic and non-dyslexic groups, the uh, slow learners, and again from a brain scan that we did with dyslexic learners, and from the cell count that we did from the autopsy brains from the autism dyslexia brain bank. Larger cells in the cerebellum for dyslexic brains. So differences again. So how do we think this affects development? We think there's an impairment at birth in the cerebellum and in the cerebellar cortical loop. That leads to a balance problem, which can be identified before, before school. But it leads to motor impairment, and that leads critically on to handwriting, one of the criterial deficits. Also articulation, which again is a motor skill. Um, and that impacts on phonological awareness. And there are also problems in becoming automatic in skill and knowledge. Eye movements may be impaired. And the phonological awareness is the direct route through, involving graphene phoneme translation problems, problems in recognising the whole words. And that leads directly into the reading problems and also into the spelling problems. And of course, all of this speed and accuracy problem impacts on your working memory. So in terms of the uh, three criterion skills, the writing, it's the motor skills, the automatization and the links to spelling, the reading, it's the phonological problems, automatization problems, a link to eye movements, and spelling, grapheme, phonemes, word recognition, and the automatization problems. So balance is a problem, but it's not causal for the reading. It's not on the main route. So if we look at the three main, four main uh, hypotheses for dyslexia, it explains the phonological deficit because it's centrally involved in the uh, development and automization of phonological skills and centrally involved in the development of automization and speed 
and the automaticity deficit because it's centrally involved in, the, in, in, in developing automaticity and the magnocellular deficit is not so clear but it has been said that the cerebellum is the head ganglion of the magnocellular system. So let's go to comorbidity because this is one of the key issues I think at the moment. There's a huge overlap, as Gita said so, 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 so uh, strikingly in her presentation yesterday, between symptoms of different developmental disorders. Uh, researchers across the, across the area have coming up with these problems. Kaplan particularly studied a population-based sample, 179 children, and if they met the criteria for dyslexia, 51% uh, had a chance of another disorder, and if they met the criteria for ADHD, and 80% had a chance of another disorder. So in developmental disorders, comorbidity is the rule, not the exception. So we shouldn't be surprised if our children have all these problems. It would be what we should expect, and it's something that we begin to need to address. So dyslexia and ADHD, 30 to 50%. Dyslexia and SLI, 50% of children with SLI go on to develop dyslexia. Uh, Dyslexia and DCD, developmental coordination disorder, around 20%, but it's not clear how much overlap there is between dyslexia and general learning problems. But it's not symmetrical. So it's not the link from SLI to poor reading is stronger than the link from poor reading to SLI. It's not that you can't read and then you develop a language problem. It's the other way around. Here's a study we did with dyspraxic children Lovely study. We had children throwing mud. Everyone loved it. So we had dyslexic children, dyspraxic children, and children with mixed dyslexia and dyspraxia. And the first slide shows everyone was great at doing it. And then we put on these magic lenses, which moved their focus. Uh, prisms. And that's a cerebellar task. Um, and so when we put on these prisms, all the three groups readjusted to the changes, but the controls adjusted significantly faster. So here we have the effect size, the difference between the dyslexics first of all, the pure dyspraxics, and then the mixed dyslexics, dyslexics, dyslexics and dyspraxics. And you can see the red line is um, one standard deviation um, away, and most of those children are showing significant impairments in that cerebellar task. Okay, so it's an opportunity to bring together the learning disabilities. We started off in the 70s with looking at minimal brain dysfunction and soft developmental signs. Then we moved away to individual groups looking at their particular difference. Each disorder had individual societies and we developed our own support group diagnosis and funding. And it was really successful. But now we need to actually bring that back together because we need to speak to each other. Next year, we hope to include in this conference a much wider group of, of researchers from developmental differences because we can share that knowledge instead of it being fragmented. And it's time for research purposes to bring that together to look at the commonalities, but I think also for intervention. Let's look at procedural learning. The immediate stage of learning involves many brain regions. Practice involves the cerebellum, the striatum, the motor cortex. And then consolidation, there's two roots. Um, that's either the striatal or the cerebellum. Automaticity involves the striatum and the cerebellum. And here they diverge. And there are different routes for motor adaptation and motor learning. And one involves the cortex and the cerebellum, and the other the cortex and the striatum. So let's look at the brain. Here we have two different views of the brain. Okay, here in blue we've got the areas that do the declarative memory, the declarative learning. That's the one that dyslexics are so good at. And here in red we have the areas that do the procedural learning. That's the one that dyslexics are so bad at. And they actually conspire and compete for who's going to be in charge. So here we have the levels of analysis, biological, cognitive and behavioural and behind it all the genetics, and in between we have the neural systems. So we have some unknown cause or causes in terms of the genetics, and we have the cerebellar deficit at the biological le level, 
Then we have at the neural systems level, in between the biology and the cognition, the neural systems, the procedural learning. And then we have the cognitive difficulties, automaticity, phonology, working memory and speed. And then at in the behavioural level, we have poor procedural learning, overemphasis on control processing, and the possibility of secondary sym symptoms. So here we have the idea that the core difficulties in dyslexia relate to the language-based component of the procedural learning system, and the declarative is performing at normal or above normal levels. And other components may be fine or they may be affected. And so that's why we get heterogeneity. Okay. <clears throat> so why are there co comorbidities? Well, learning disabilities share different systems via different abnormalities, and many cases will arise from abnormal brain development. Relatively common for the brain development to be distributed rather than localised, and so you would expect there would be an overlap. So for dyslexia, it's the neocerebellum, the new cerebellum. For SLI, it's the basal ganglia. For dyspraxia, the verbal cerebellum and the motor areas. For attention deficit, the cerebellum. But it's a new and integrative way of putting together the, the different systems. So it's a possible explanation, a new integrative framework, it includes all of the learning difficulties within a framework directly consistent with co current theory, and it explains all the comorbidities. And it, it's not just for theory, it's for diagnosis and support. So let's look at how it would develop. If there's a problem in the motor system, it would lead to motor skill deficits, uh, also in speech, very motor-based. Language would impact, of course, on speech, but also on phonology. So uh, if there's a general declarative learning, then it's general learning difficulties. So, and all of these, of course, interact. Motor skills directly into dys to dyspraxia, speech into SLI, and the phonology into dyslexia. But look at the interactions between them all. So how does it happen? Many developmental differences rise during the period when the cells migrate during the formation of the brain in the fetus. And many factors lead to small differences in the organisation, both for the neurons within the brain and also for the tracts between the different structures. Many brain regions are involved at different stages in learning. And it's very likely that if some uh, structural differences in the cerebellum will also lead to differences in the cortex and across the rest of the brain. And so the precise pattern of difficulties you get will depend on the particular pattern. That is why there's so much heterogeneity individual differences, and the differences are likely to be of degree rather than absolute. So we need to see that comorbidity would be the rule rather than the exception. So for a given child, that specific pattern of declarative and procedural difficulties and strengths, we mustn't forget the strengths, would be unique to that child. We do need to find the way the child learns best. And current educational tools tend to test attainment, where children are, not what their potential is. There are very few for non-declarative learning. So we need to develop tests for those different types of learning, and we need to be able to tailor the learning environment to the child's learning abilities and disabilities. So in many cases, it mirrors established methods, but we need to be, bring in our un increased understanding of the brain. So diagnosis for support, we look at the stages of learning. Brings us back to Gita's questions. We look at different types of learning. There are many different forms of learning. Some are much less affected, these are much less affected by levels of attainment, and they're closely linked to the support <coughs> strategies. And we have different needs. Dyslexic is always dyslexic. You learn strategies, you overcome different aspects, but you are always dyslexic and will always process differently. And we need different approaches for the child and the adult. And I'm very proud of the work that we're doing at the very younger stage group and now moving towards the secondary level and beyond with the work that Ashraf is doing and Carly at the DAS. We need to look at learning abilities and disabilities. And again, we're now beginning to look at the strengths as well as the weaknesses. That marvellous book that Deborah constructed uh, on our strengths in dyslexia. These are the areas that we need to be looking at to encourage our children to understand their strengths as well as their weaknesses. So in terms of the theory, let's go back to those challenges. 
Do we need to teach them the way they learn? Well, of course, because the square root rule shows that they're going to need, uh, they'll never catch up with traditional support. <laughs> they need much more intensive support for longer, uh, and then they have the opportunity to, um, to match or even outpace their peers. How should we teach them? Well, we need to give more thought to methods of enhancing procedural learning including things like overnight consolidation, which seems to be a specific problem. And so it's crucial to have repeated practice each day, but build on those declarative strengths. Acknowledge those strengths that the child has and use those to enhance their weaknesses. So that comorbidity, why do we have those learning difficulties? Because there are multiple underlying subsystems and they don't map uniquely onto the primary systems. So children will have a mix they will have the heterogeneity. And looking at those brain differences, the neural systems level seems to be a fruitful source of insight. It bridges that gap between cognition, uh, uh, such as the phonology, and the brain structures, such as the cerebellum. So it's important to consider how learning disabilities develop over time. And the analysis of learning in its different forms and different timescales can provide the method for theory and for practice. It's important not to disregard the commonalities between disorders because those secondary symptoms may hold the key to differentiating between them at the brain level. And supporting those secondary systems will allow us to improve on their primary symptoms. The neural symptoms seem a promising level of explanation for providing the necessary integration while permitting further analysis. So, there is much to be done, but we can all contribute and I am very proud of what DAS have already contributed and will continue to contribute in the field. Thank you very much. Let's give uh, Professor Fawcett another round of applause. Thank you, Professor Fawcett.